Hello friends, today I'm going to cheer up this lonely Mac 512. Let's have some fun. To truly put a smile on his face, I'm going to be doing a fun and useful motherboard mod. Rominate me. What he's referring to is the Rominator kit that was originally sold by Big Mess of Wires. The original idea was developed by Rob Braun. Steve Chamberlain, the proprietor of Big Mess of Wires, helped co-develop what later became the Rominator. And there's a link to the original development discussion on the website too. The kit allows you to install a 1 megabyte bootable ROM disk on your Macintosh Plus, 512K, 512KE, and even the 128K. You can do the 64K or 128K ROM. Now, some of you may know that the Macintosh Classic was the first Mac to offer ROM booting. It would boot into System 6 when you held down the Command, Option, X, and O keys at Power On. But it didn't include any software, and it didn't allow you to modify the contents of ROM. In contrast, the Rominator allows you to add any compatible software you like, and even has a dedicated app for you to change that software on the fly without the need to remove or touch the motherboard. Now, the kit that I'm going to be working on in this video today, uh, you can see by the red color of this circuit board uh, that it is not the same kit as the Big Mess of Wires originally sold. And that's because Big Mess of Wires no longer sells the kit. I spoke to Steve Chamberlain recently and he said it was just too much trouble, so he, he shut, shut it down. And he also told me that if anyone wants to sell the kit, he's not opposed to that at all. Um, currently, there's nobody who actively sells this kit, but uh, I was able to talk to a very kind gentleman by the name of Kei Koba, who's based in Tokyo here in Japan, and uh, he had a spare kit that he created. Yes, that's right. You can go to the Big Mess of Wires website and has all the Gerber files and everything you need to actually create the kit for yourself. And that's what he did. He created this uh, circuit board using those files. And of course, you also need the ROMs, but he had uh, some ROMs. Now, just to let you know, he asked me, do I have the ability to program ROMs? And I told him I have a ProMate 3 programmer from Microchip, which handles some SST chips. But when I got the chips, I realized Microchip, despite having bought the SST brand back in 2010, they still don't support these chips. So thankfully, Kay said, okay, just send the chips back to me and I'll program them. And that's exactly what he did. He very kindly programmed them for me and even put high and low stickers <laughs> on them to make it easy to install. So uh, truly this video is dedicated to Kay Koba. Uh, without him, I wouldn't have been able to do it. So, Keikova is also on the uh, Vintage Apple Macintosh Enthusiast Facebook group. So some of you may have seen some of his posts there. He's got a, a big collection of Macs and he's got some great mods too. I mean, excellent work that he does too. So if you ever see K uh, on that uh, Facebook group, uh, be sure to say hi and uh, uh, let him know your thoughts about his posts. But basically he included the PCB, uh, the ROMs, he gave me some sockets, and I did have to buy some parts uh, because not everything was included that he had. So I bought some of this very cheaply on Amazon. All said, what I'm going to do in this video today is three things. First of all, I'm going to show you how to assemble uh, the kit. Number two, I'm going to show you how to install it on the motherboard. And number three, we're going to test it. We're gonna see how the software works that comes with it. And then we're gonna test out the software to see how to add new software uh, to the ROM, which is pretty neat because in most cases you can do that without ever touching the motherboard. You can just do it while you're using your Mac because of the special app that Steve Chamberlain created. So let's get started. And here's my workbench area. I printed out the instructions from the Big Mess of Wires website, which tells me everything I need. Basically, you're gonna to need to have a soldering iron. Without that, you're not gonna be able to do anything. Mine is an older model Hakko 937 soldering station set to 350 degrees. You can get the newer, brighter Fisher-Price color version, and uh, it'll do just as good of a job. If you're only gonna do this one kit, or if you're very rarely gonna solder, you don't need an expensive hako. You can just get a cheap Chinese product and, and really that would be fine. But if you've got at least one vintage Mac, probably you're gonna be doing a lot of soldering. You might as well invest in something good. The hako brand is a very high quality Japanese name that you can rely on. And I have also, this is a Hakko 599B. You don't need a Hakko branded one, but basically it lets you take your uh, soldering iron and you can clean him off in here, or you can do that if you've got a sponge as well. 
I've got two different kinds of solder here uh, based upon thickness. This is just a thin one, this is a thicker one. Uh, you can just use the thin solder if that's all you have, or even the thick solder, you know, it's, either way is going to work. And uh, sometimes the thin solder is better if you're doing the SMD work, but it's really up to you. It just, for me, this is what I have, two different thicknesses of the solder. I've got my wire color cutters over here. I've also got my microscope, my lenses, in case uh, I've got really small parts I need to solder. I've got that. Most of this stuff is going to be linked for you in the text description below. So check there to uh, see what's available. A lot of it you can buy on Amazon. And then over here, I've got this fan. So when I turn it on, the air is going to blow in this direction. So the flux fumes, rather than going up and into my nose, it's going to go out in a way. You should always work in a very well ventilated area so you don't breathe in all these flux fumes. I've been soldering for many, many years since my high school years and I'm fine, but still, it's best if you can limit uh, the, the uh, toxins that are coming into your body by having uh, a fan to blow it away. And then of course I have my uh, circuit board and the sockets and chips and everything ready. So uh, basically the first order of business according to the instructions is in the Big Mess of Wires kit, the uh, surface mount IC was already pre-mounted to the board, but because I got this from K Koba here in Japan, this, the chip is not mounted on there, so that's the first order of business. I'm going to put that surface mount chip and solder it down on its pads. Now here's the chip under the microscope because I really can't see it with the naked eye, and there is no groove that usually shows you where pin 1 is. Instead, you've got this very tiny circle so if you don't have a microscope, you can use a magnifying glass to see it. But basically, this is showing you that pin 1 is going to be right here on this side. And that's where we're going to line up the chip. And here's our board. We can see that the notch marking is here. So that means pin 1 is supposed to go here. Tack down two feet to hold him on there. And under the microscope, we can see that uh, there are no solder bridges. Very clean solder applied to every foot. Now I'll just spray some alcohol on him so I can clean off some of the flux. And now the instructions are telling us to break these uh, machined pin headers into four pieces each having 14 pins and again this I did not get the original big mess of wires kit so I had to buy this separately the link to which is in the text description below and we've got 14 here we'll just go ahead and cut these and now that we have our four pieces we need to insert them into the bottom side of the board uh, this is the side without the surface mount chip on it now the instructions recommend putting the long end into the sockets, not permanently, but just temporarily to make sure that during your soldering you, you get everything lined up just right. And then you have to make absolutely sure that, in, in my case, I have a Macintosh 512K. So for the 128K, 512K, 512KE, you're going to use this row of pads. For the Mac Plus only, you're going to use this row of 14. And of course down here as well, you see it says 512K, so you would put another 14 pin header in these, and not this. You would leave these blank. But if you have a Plus, then you would use these and not the ones that's marked 512. And then down below, it says all. So it doesn't matter if you have a plus or not, you would use this one and this one. 
And this is how it looks. You can see it's in the place where it's marked 512K. The short end is going into the circuit board. The long end is going into this socket. And again, the socket is not a permanent thing. It's just to hold the 14 pin headers in there perfectly straight while you do your soldering. And you're gonna do your soldering on the opposite side of the board. Now go ahead and put some flux on the board. Push it down for good measure. And on the flip side of the board, add a little flux here. And here's how it looks from the side. And we can go ahead and uh, remove our sockets. And with the sockets removed, you can see we've got all four connected. This one in the 512K slot, this one in the 512K slot, and then down here, whether you have a plus or anything else, uh, they all will go in the all section. And here's the solder side after I cleaned it with alcohol. Now you don't want to put the chips directly into the circuit board like this without using the sockets for two reasons. Here's the first reason. As you can see on the right side of each chip, the solder pads are preventing the right side from going down as far as it could. True, you could trim those down a bit, but still it wouldn't go down all the way. That's the first reason. The second and most important reason is that if anything goes wrong, you're not going to be able to easily take out the chip to reprogram it. But if you have a socket, you can. Now when putting in the sockets, one thing I noticed is this naughty little pin is touching this black piece of plastic that's on the socket. You can see it, the little tiny black piece. Rather than cutting that partly off, it's probably better to just trim off, trim down that one little pin. And that way, you, you want to make sure that your socket is pressed all the way down to the board. Well, even with that pin cut short, it still didn't play well. So I'm going to cut off a small amount of this guy. And now we can see it fits just right. Now, while I was able to fix this left side socket by chopping down that one pin and then cutting off a little bit of this portion of the socket, the right socket has a bigger problem. And if you look closely, you can see that all of these solder pads are just a little bit more to the left of the right edge of this socket than this. These solder pads are more to the right such that even though the tips do not touch the plastic here on the right side of the socket, they are shaped like mountains. So part of that solder hits. And so this right side is raised up a bit as a result. Now I'm not too happy about this, but the only way to solve the problem that I can see is to shave off uh, very carefully <laughs> part of the underside on that uh, socket. And here's what it looks like after I've shaved off enough to make it sit down flush. It took me about five minutes. And as you can see, the little teensy tiny foot here and here are making contact with the top of the circuit board, which is what we want. Now these sockets aren't the same sockets that Steve Chamberlain shipped with his kit. His sockets had a little 
piece of plastic that went through the middle. So maybe that's just something inherent to these sockets that Kay shipped me, I'm not too sure. But if the circuit board could be modified so that this rightmost socket could be shifted just a millimeter to the right, then no matter what socket you use, you wouldn't have to resort to shaving it in order to make it fit. But even if you do have to shave it, it really wasn't too hard. It was easier than I thought. You just have to be careful. That's really the key. And before soldering in, just make sure that the little groove in both of the sockets is towards this particular chip and not the other way around. So just like last time, we'll apply some flux and then get to the soldering. And here are our finished solder joints. Next, we want to solder in two pads here and here. To accomplish that, I could just take two pins from one of the headers out of the kit that I purchased from Amazon and just do it as a jumper. But instead, I'm going to use some small parts out of my jumper kit for breadboards that I've had for decades, specifically the little U-shaped parts here. And I'm going to put them here and here. Now, of course, because I have a Macintosh 512K and not a Plus, that's why we need to bridge 512K and Common here and here. But the reason I opted not to use jumpers is because there's no meaning. Uh, you, you might say, well, what if I want to switch between 512K and Plus? Well, the jumper makes that easy, but you're going to have to desolder, <laughs> right? Uh, some of the pins that we just soldered in because some have to be for the plus and others for the 512k so you know honestly if you have a plus you might as well just buy a new kit and that's why i don't see any need for a jumper here just make it a a more semi-permanent solder connection And here's how they look. Next, we need to deal with the wires that will connect this circuit board to the CPU on the motherboard. These 90 degree angled pins were part of the kit I bought from Amazon. So I cut off four of them and I'm going to use that. And with that angled header in there, I can now connect uh, some other wires that I have in another kit, uh, which is linked for you in the text description below. These will just plug right in like so, and then I can add three more. And here is the board after giving it a thorough toothbrush and alcohol cleaning. And here we have my Mac 512K motherboard. Uh, just a few comments before we jump into it. You'll notice that these three capacitors are yellow and non-stock, and that's because I recapped this board. 
Yes, you need to recap the 128K, 512K, and plus, don't let anybody tell you otherwise, these axials do not have eternal life. Well, these axials uh, cl come close to it because they're tantalum, but uh, I have a video on that. Please see my video on how to do it. It is something that I strongly advise you to do, even if you're not having problems. And just a few other things, I added some hot glue around this keyboard connector because without it, it's a little bit loose, and if you insert and remove quite often, you, you will rock the connector around and it can cause intermittent connectivity. So to prevent that, I put some hot glue around it. These are the memory chips here. These do not have the Apple logo. These are more reliable than the Apple logo brand. So if you have some boards with the Apple logo chips, it could be that you're going to get a sad Mac because one of them might be bad. They're, they're quite bad compared to some of the later chips like this. Uh, this CPU, by the way, is one of the older models, Ceramics. It's dated 1983. The models that came later were black plastic P-dips. And the attention that we need to focus on is the two ROM chips right here, so we need to remove these. And before pulling the ROMs, I should just say that I'm going to put on my little grounded wrist strap to avoid any potential problems there and touch the metal part of my screwdriver that I'm going to use to lift up these chips. If you've got an IC puller, you can use that. Some people may prefer it, but a little flathead screwdriver very carefully used, can pry them up. For sensitive people, if you're worried about denting the plastic sockets, you could put a little heat shrink around it and make it softer. But I'm not going to do that because I'm lazy and it's not really that needed. And you're not gonna be able to see any little dents on the socket underneath anyway. So just do both sides. And they're not that hard to pry out. I'm just being very careful. That's why it's taking this long. And there's ROM high and ROM low. Now our ROMinator kit goes on just like so. But before we press him down, we need to take into consideration these four pins here. We need to connect four wires and that's going to run to four different points on the CPU for the Mac 512. And for the Mac Plus, there's only three points that you have to worry about. But again, this is a Mac 512 motherboard. So what I'm going to do is measure and see what the links need to be. And here are my wires. And again, this because this didn't come in a complete kit from K Koba, again, I did not buy this from Steve Chamberlain's Big Mess of Wires because it's no longer sold. So I purchased these wires on Amazon and I'll put a link for you in the text description below. But basically we can choose any colors we like. They're all stuck together right now. But um, if I get four wires, I don't know what's the red, orange, green, that might be nice. Because we're gonna need four wires. I separated the red wire because according to the big mess of wires instructions, R slash W needs to connect to pin nine of the 68,000 and then A19, 18, 17 connect to pins 47, 46, and 45 respectively. So that means our red wire, I'm not sure why R and W didn't go over here, but Anyway, uh, it's going to be about like that. So I can cut him about right there. And then these remaining three wires are going to be about, about in the center of the chip. So for now, I'll just cut some extra length like that. All right, so here's what I did. I decided to separate the wires for reasons I'll show you in a moment. I stripped the tips of each of the wires. I put solder at the tip, and then I cut them fairly short, as you can see here. So 
So as you can see, I took my pencil and I made a very faint marking on pin 9. That's where R slash W will go. That's this red wire. And then I made three markings on pins 45, 46, and 47. And the reason I separated these wires is because A17, which is the green wire, is supposed to go up here. The yellow wire will go in the middle marking area. And the orange wire is supposed to go over here, so it would have been nice if the PCB would have been structured a little bit better. But, you know, it's not a problem. So basically, you're going to be overlapping the orange and green wires uh, when you saw their, them on here. And I use pencil on this ceramic because I just need to erase it, you know. It's easy to erase to eliminate that marking. So now I'm going to put a little solder on pin 9. You can see my pencil marking there. Just a little bit. Now we're going to apply a little bit of solder to these three guys. And these 17. my green wire and A19 and here's a close-up after I put a little bit more solder on them I push the rominator all the way down deep into the motherboard sockets as far as it will go now this is what I see. The little pins you see right here and here and here, that's a gap. It's at least one millimeter, maybe one and a half millimeters between the bottom of this plastic piece, which is part of the rominator, and then the top of this black piece, which is the socket on the motherboard. And that's unfortunate because I wanted it to be as low profile as possible. The pins are just too long for this low profile socket, but to cut each and every one of them is a lot of trouble, so I'm just going to avoid doing that. And with that all finished, it's now time to do our ROMs. I already straightened out the pins, so they're going straight down. And thanks to Koba's stickers, we can see low is printed on the circuit board, and of course the sticker here is showing us low. We just need to make sure that the groove matches the groove in the actual chip itself. Don't press down until you feel the feet in both sides. That one's in there. And now it's time to see if the rominator is too low or too high to fit in nicely. And I suspect it's going to be too high because even though it's probably going to fit here, there's a little protruding groove right here that juts out this way that I'm quite sure it will not it will not get past. And as I suspected, it's just barely touching here. And even though I could push it down and squeeze it through, that protruding piece of metal that sticks out down about a centimeter and a half, that's going to block it from sliding down. So, what we need to do is take our trusty flathead screwdriver and we're going to pull him up So that the bottom doesn't touch the plastic. We are going to need to wedge him in there. And voila. 
Now there is clearance above the rominator, but as you can see, it's uh, not very much. Now it's time for the smoke test. The time when your heart is pounding like mad because you don't know what's going to happen. And honestly, I don't because I've not tested it prior to what you're saying right now. So what you are seeing now is what I'm saying for the very first time. So I'm going to flip the power on and we're going to see what's going to happen. Oh my gosh. Oh, what a relief. It's working. Okay, let's try that again. I'm not sure if I really like that startup beep or not, but the good news is we can change it. Now to boot up, we need to type R. And right now, folks, you're saying it boot off wrong. Wasn't that fast? Even on your modern Mac, nothing boots that fast, right? Wow. Okay. So we have access to our control panels here can boost the sound. I don't have a PRAM battery inside, so it's not going to save all the settings. Um, they don't sell those PRAM batteries in Japan. On Amazon US, they do. I'll put a link to one down in the description below for you folks who are lucky enough to live in the US. But we can see we've got mostly games here. And we have MacWrite. Let's see how fast it loads. Okay, now remember, folks, this is a Mac 512, and that's pretty fast. <laughs> that's pretty fast. What else do we have? We have Mac Draw 1.9.5. Okay, so that's snappy as well. And uh, remember that this is basically just a little bit larger than an 800K floppy disk. It's 846K in disk, that's what it says here. And uh, so this is truly the limit says only 3k available so uh, big mess of wires steve chamberlain really maxed out this particular disc and we can see about the finder it's finder 5.5 and if we go in here and go to system i'm not sure if git info will tell us sometimes it doesn't on the older operating systems it could be well i don't really know I didn't check that point, but um, using an older version system in Finder can sometimes give you more space in the disk. And so what I'm going to do right now is rather than fiddle around playing these games, which any of you can do, I am going to connect my floppy EMU and boot from that. Okay, so I now have my floppy EMU connected to the floppy disk port on the back and I have already put on some software that uh, the flash tool and other stuff that's on the big mess of wires website including my own custom disk image and we're going to try to reprogram some things and see how well that works now this is set up to boot in HD 20 mode and because we have 128k ROMs in there it'll boot just fine without any kind of floppy and so right now what you're saying is it's booted off of the disk that's on here which is 20 megabytes and I have a flash tool 1.6 which is the latest as of today and I can show you that in about this finder uh, this is uh, finder version 5.3 that it's booted off of right now, it's system version 3.2. And on this disk, I have the disk that I created, which has an older version, system 3.2, and finder version 5.3, I think, that's um, going to save some space. And I have some happy Mac icons that we can try changing and see how that, that goes. And then uh, in here, this is also downloadable from Steve Chamberlain's site. There's uh, code. You can see the 64K stock ROM, and here's code patched. And then the startup sounds that were included with it, too. And there's a Quadra sound that I think I'm probably going to like. I've not tested it before, but 
let's just give uh, some of these things a try. So I'm going to open up Flash Tool. And again, this, what you're seeing now is, is um, what I'm saying for the first time. I've not tested this out, actually. <laughs> so let's hope it works. Uh, startup sound. I'm not really a fan of the stock sound. I don't even know what it's called. Maybe it's called ping. Kind of sounds like a ping. But I want to do uh, the quadra sound. Now we can't just click the flash button. We've got to use some intelligence here. It says ROM area to update. And uh, the startup sound is what we need to check the radio button there. And it says the sound file, any sound up to about 20, 28K. And it says our file size is 15K. So pending no bit errors with this file, let's go ahead and update the ROM and see what happens. Are you sure? Yes. And... Oh. Goody. It finished the update successfully. Okay. So let's see what happened then. We are going to restart or shut down. There is no restart here. Oh, did you hear that? It was a short kind of cut too short sound, but it's kind of nice. Let me do that again. Flip off power and then we'll flip on power. It's kind of nice. I like it. Boom. It's, it's not the full sound, but it sounds better than the stock one. And that's how easy it is to program. Right? So if we go back in, I want to swap out this stock disk with mine. And what I, what I basically did is use Mini VMAC on my modern Mac to create this. What am I doing here? Get info. Uh, this is, it says 884K. Um, basically that it accounts for but this is a dsk file that i opened up in mini vmac and then moved over software and confirmed that it works so hopefully this isn't going to give me any trouble and it'll flash and just work that's what i'm hoping because i've not done this before so you're going to see it for the very first time and so we're going to say, okay, the radio button ROM disk image. And it says 884736. Is that what it was? I can't remember. I have a bad memory. And that's why I got into YouTube in the first place so I could remember things. <laughs> I'm serious. I forget, I'm forgetful. So it, it helped me to remember how I did things. 884736. Okay, so just, you know, reconfirming. 884736 is exactly what we need. We're going to select the file, which is called Rominator. Okay, scratch that. I actually made a mistake. <laughs> I didn't see JDW in the name, and, and sure enough, it was a blank disk. But I didn't, I didn't program that one. I just stopped myself, burned it again to the floppy EMU, and now I have the correct hyphen JDW disk on there. And just to look at this file size, we see 884736, okay? So now we'll go into our flash tool here, and we have ROM disk image selected, 884736 is the size that we need. We're gonna go ahead and select my JDW disk, and then we're gonna hope for the best. Are you sure? Now, Steve Chamberlain said this could take up to 60 seconds, so we're gonna see here Progress bar. Oh, okay, there we got a little bit of progress bar. That makes me feel better. <laughs> makes me feel better. And uh, I guess I'll speed this up for you in, in post so you don't have to wait. All right. Finished successfully. So we'll now try it out. 
Now you'll note that while I booted off the floppy EMU, there is no icon for the ROM disk. So I'm going to have to disconnect my floppy EMU and then boot. All right, floppy EMU is removed. Got my same Quadra startup sound. And pressing R. And it booted off of it. And yes, this is exactly what I should see. We've got Finder 5.3. And I put some utilities on here for me. And we can see we've got Mac ID. Shows us we've got 128K ROMs, HFS system. System version is 3.2. And of course, it gives us other screen information. And then we've got PRAM, which basically what I use it mostly for is to set the time so you can conveniently set the year. I'm not going to set the time now because I don't have a PRAM battery in here, but it's quite a convenient app to have. You can do a lot of other fun things with it too, so that's why I put it on here. And then we've got uh, memory test, which is showing me that I've got um, the 128K ROM, 68,000 CPU, my volume is Rominator disk, HFS system, and free memory, 422K. So, um, I also put on some uh, hard disk 20 utilities because I actually do have a real hard disk 20, so I thought those would be useful. And in, in terms of the disk benchmark app, I'm going to do another video on this, so I'm not going to reveal any information about it right now, but basically it's a brand new app that somebody wrote recently in 2021. Then I have a full set of games here from uh, Stunt Copter to glider to crystal raider probably should turn up the volume because i don't have a pram battery that didn't stick all right and then if we load crystal raider you know this as crystal quest but crystal quest is the more full featured version and crystal raider is the earliest version which doesn't have all of the fancy sound effects You see, it just has the basic sound effects. Well, I didn't know how to abort, so I just restarted. Good thing about the ROM disk is it boots, boots up pretty fast. And of course, you've got your glider. I really wanted to put Load Runner on it, but it just takes up too much information, too much space, so I wasn't able to do that. And uh, there is, I don't believe any sound effects in this particular one. Sound on, well, maybe there should be sound, but I didn't see any, didn't hear any sound coming out of it. And then of course, other games uh, include Cairo Shootout, Missile Command, Stunt Copter. I'm not gonna go through all the games, but basically you can see I've I fit quite a lot on here. Hendrix, I used this way back in 1984 when I got my first Macintosh 128K. It's kind of a fun app. You, 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 you click and move the mouse. And I guess it's supposed to simulate some kind of crazy electric guitar. Anyway, I always thought it was kind of fun just to click around with it. MacWrite 4.5. Right? Oh, well, that's interesting, right? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't anticipate that. And then instead of Mac Paint, I did Full Paint because Full Paint will let you expand it out even to the full screen. So you can do things like this. Hello. Right? It's kind of fun. Full paint lets you take advantage of the full screen. 
And by the way, I used full paint to actually create the images in the opening segment of the uh, of this video. So when you saw him talking and saw the animation, I actually did it frame by frame uh, in full paint, displaying it full screen. So very much almost identical to Mac Paint, except it lets you use your your full screen. So I'm going to boot off my floppy EMU again here and just show you one final thing with the flash tool. I did not change the icons. So I'm going to see what happens when I try that. And to do that, we want to choose alternate happy Mac icons. And some of the names I'm not really too sure about code with a side. I, I don't know what that means, code with a side. So I'm going to uh, give that a try. And now this is, it's not named very nicely. It says ROM code, but actually this is the one we want to choose for the icons. It should say icons, just like this says startup sound, which is pretty easy to understand. I wish this had said icons. But anyway, you can see it's supposed to be 135, 168 bytes. And notice that our file up here is 135, 168 bytes. So we're going to update ROM. Yes. OK, and then now I'm going to shut down and disconnect my floppy EMU and then boot from the ROM again. And it still shows the pirate icon, but if I hold down, oh, well, for a very brief time, I saw the sly face, the sly face. So I guess that's what aside means. Actually, I just saw where it might be useful. So I'm going to update the icon again, this time with the cheesy, it says cheese, but it means smiling. Now, by the way, I'm moving the mouse, but the arrow cursor isn't moving. But I guess Steve Chamberlain wrote it that way so that it's not going to take up CPU cycles. It's not frozen or anything like that. And where you're able to see the icons the longest, is when you boot off another disk or the floppy EMU. So I'm going to show you that right now by restarting. And I have my floppy EMU connected. So see, now you could, you could, for at least for a brief time anyway, you could see the smiley face, right? And so if you, if you boot off a slower disk, you're going to be able to see it for a longer period of time. Uh, the only other thing that we could say about Flash Tool is, uh, I'm not going to do this for you, but on the website it talked about you can make longer sounds. So maybe I could make the full quadra sound. I'm not sure. Maybe if I, if I do that uh, and follow according to the instructions on the Big Mess of Wires website. But in a nutshell, that's basically what the Rominator will do for you. And if you don't want to boot from ROM, you just don't boot from ROM and it will automatically boot from your external hard disk 20, your floppy EMU, your regular floppy disk, or whatever. And this is just a nice way to boot from ROM, similar to the Macintosh Classic, except that you can put some more useful software uh, on your disk that uh, Apple did not put on the Macintosh Classic ROM. So something fun. You can change the sounds, other things. And that's basically the Rominator. I'm Rominated. Now it's time to Rominate your own Macintosh 128K, 512K, or Plus. The good news is that I spoke to Kay Koba just prior to filming this closing segment. And uh, Kay said that he touched bases with Steve Chamberlain. And they worked out a deal so that Kay uh, will offer the complete kit for sale. It will ship out of his location in Tokyo, Japan. And the benefit of that is that even though you can still go to the Big Mess of Wires website, download the Gerber files, make the PCB yourself, uh, having a complete kit will save you a lot of time and money because you won't have to buy parts from here and there. 
you'll get everything that you need uh, to create the kit from K. And uh, I would say that probably it will still be cheaper overall for you, even though most of you are located outside Japan and there will be some inter international shipping involved to get it to you. So be sure to check the text description below this video. You have to click show more on a desktop PC to expand it out and see all the links there. I put a lot of information for you down there, folks, and this video is completely indexed too, so you can jump to different parts of the video quite easily uh, using that index. But you'll find a link to Keikova's website there. Uh, he's still working on it as of the making of this video right now, but uh, hopefully over the next few days, it will uh, be ready for you and you can place an order whenever he gets uh, all the, the parts in stock. So uh, you, you've just seen in this video how, how fun this kit is. Yeah, it requires a little bit of soldering, that, but that's part of the fun. Uh, this is a mod that's fully reversible. Uh, yes, you'll have to desolder if you really want to take it out, but I doubt that you'll really want to do that. Once you get, get used to it, it'll just be too fun and enjoyable to, to take it out. But technically speaking, you can do that. You just desolder the wires on your uh, CPU and you pull it out of the socket and put your uh, stock ROM chips back in and, and that's pretty much all there is to it. I'd also like to uh, thank right now uh, Rob Braun and Steve Chamberlain, uh, because without those two gentlemen, we wouldn't even have the Rominator to begin with. But I wish to thank them because uh, both of them responded to my emails during the making of this video, answering a lot of technical questions that were extremely helpful. So thank you to you both. Next, I'd like to thank uh, three very special people who contributed to this uh, site by PayPal. The first is Maro Asiakaferi. I mentioned his name before in the last several videos because he has been supporting this channel by PayPal on a monthly basis since March 2021. So uh, with a humble heart, Maro, I, I truly wish to thank you uh, for continuing to enjoy this channel so much that you're willing to contribute to it each and every month. Uh, next, I wish to thank Richard Malone, who made a very generous contribution a bit over a month ago. I've already thanked Richard privately, but I always like to offer my thanks publicly as well. Um, Thank you very much, Richard, for that. It'll certainly go towards making this channel better. And by the way, I, ask, I always ask people whenever they contribute, do you have a website or some other information that I can plug? I'm more than happy to do it. And he said, well, um, I do have a website, but it's not related to vintage Macs, so probably your viewers wouldn't find it useful. And I said, that's okay. You know, I've, I've linked it for you down in the text description below. It could be that uh, his company, he's co-founder, by the way, it could offer some services that may interest some of you, so be sure to check that out. And then I'd like to thank Jeff from Seattle. Uh, it kind of surprised me. I've, I've been talking to Jeff uh, off and on about our mutual love of vintage Max by email privately, and uh, just out of the blue, he, he blessed me with a, um, a wonderful and generous donation. So I wish to thank you very much, Jeff, for that. Uh, he's currently working on a RAM upgrade for one of his vintage Macs, and he's had some uh, issues with some bad chips and uh, is dealing with that right now so uh, hopefully he can get that squared away and be able to boost it up to two megabytes of RAM. Next of course I, I wish to thank each and every one of you who have been watching especially those of you if you've been watching it from the very beginning until now well thank you very much. Uh, if you like this video please consider giving it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content like this well, please subscribe and be sure to click the bell icon to receive notifications whenever I come out with a new video. And again, if you have any kind of uh, comments or questions, because I read and reply to every comment, uh, please put those down in the comment section below. Thanks again, folks, and I wish each and every one of you a wonderful day.